Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited for uh, Dr. Jett's presentation, and we're glad that you are here. Uh, my name is Claire Eagle, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Historic New Harmony. Historic New Harmony is a unified program of the University of Southern Indiana and the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites. Uh, we are a site, or we are the site of two attempts at Utopia, and I think we're we're having a third right now. Um, we have quite a great community here. Uh, thank you uh, once again for attending. Um, this is not exactly what we planned. Uh, this was supposed to take place in the spring, but of course, um, due to COVID, we had to postpone. But we were able to move this speaker series uh, virtually, um, which maybe makes it a little easier for more people to join us. So we're we're happy to have that. Um, while we are not hosting the Crossroads exhibit in partnership with Indiana Humanities and the Smithsonian Museum on Main Street, um, we still wanted to continue with this uh, speaker series because these topics are just as relevant today as we kind of find our place in this new socially distant world. So we wanted to uh, further uh, connect USI New Harmony as well as bring in wonderful guests like Dr. Jet here. Uh, a few housekeeping things before we continue. Please keep yourself muted while Dr. Jett gives her presentation. Um, if you have any kind of questions or comments that you'd like to share, uh, you can get those to us in the chat and we'll make sure uh, that, that she sees those and we communicate those. Um, additionally, I believe she does have an activity for us at the end, so she will kind of take point uh, with that and give you some instructions as well. Uh, finally, this presentation is being recorded. So if something happens or if you can't stay for the whole time, uh, do not fret. It will be uploaded to our Historic New Harmony playlist on the USI YouTube page uh, within two to three days, depending on kind of when we get it up there. So Terry is originally from California and has a BA in Ethnic Studies, an MPA from CSU Hayward, and a PhD in Public Policy and Public Administration from Auburn University, War Eagle. Currently, she is an associate professor of political science, an affiliate faculty member of the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies Program and the Peace and Complex Studies Program, and special assistant to the Provost for Diversity and Inclusivity at Butler University. How does she have time to do this for us? That's what I want to know. She is very busy. Uh, her research interests and writing focus primarily around post-civil rights era community and economic development, as well as empowering practices that create inclusive circular and co-circular spaces. Uh, her new book, Farming for Justice, Diversity, Food Access in the USDA, uh, will be out in December. And I believe this uh, presentation does kind of align a little bit about what she talks about in that book. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give it over to Terry. All right, thank you, Claire. I'm going to share my screen and thank you to everyone uh, for joining and special shout out to my family. My parents are here. So I am honored to be here um, and to be a part of the Speakers Bureau and to speak to you all. And so since this is a talk about food and connectivity, I'm going to begin with a recipe. It's called collard greens to bring you money. And this is a book from, this is a recipe from a book by Intozaki Shange called, If I Can Cook, You Know God Can. Here's the recipe. Wash two large bunches of greens carefully, because even to this day in winter, critters can hide up in those great green leaves that are going to taste so very good. If you are an anal type, Go ahead and wash the greens with suds, a small squirt of dish detergent and warm water. Rinse thoroughly. Otherwise, an individual leaf check under cold run and water should do. Some folks like their greens chopped up just so, like rows of a field. If that's the case with you, now is the time to get your best knife out, tuck your thumb under your fingers, and go to town. On the other hand, some just want to tear the leaves up with gleeful abandon. There's nothing wrong with that either. Add to your greens that are covered with water, either a quarter pound of salt pork, bacon, ham hocks, 
two to three smoked turkey wings, three to four tablespoons of olive oil or canola oil, and a juice of one whole lemon, depending on your spiritual proclivities and prohibitions. Bring to a boil, turn down, let them simmer till the greens are the texture you want. Nouveau cuisine green eaters will have much more sculpted looking leaves than old fashioned green eaters who want the stalks to melt in their mouths along with the leaf of the collard. Again, I add one third cup of syrup or two tablespoons honey or three tablespoons molasses to my greens, but you don't have to. My mother thinks I ruin my greens that way, but she can always make her own, you know. Serve with vinegar, salt and pepper, and hot sauce to taste. It serves six to eight people. There you go, there's your greens recipe. Now I'm going to begin uh, with a portion of an interview that my cousin Lawan Taylor did with my grandfather, Rafe Taylor, uh, in 2007, and this is part of StoryCorps. So I'm going to begin and then with a portion of it and then also end with a portion of it. Hi, my name is Lawan Taylor. I'm 38 years old and I'm here today um, on March 17th, 2007th, interviewing my grandfather, Rafe Taylor, at his home in Oakland, California. Uh, grandfather, uh, can you state your name and your date of birth and where you were born? My name is Rafe Taylor, born 1914, December 19th. What town were you born in? December 19th. And like what city and state? State of Louisiana. This facts are, I can't really remember all of them. Detail. I lived in Louisiana up there all my life. I came to California in 1944. Mm -hmm. Wow, that seems like so long ago. <laughs> yeah, I was doing the war time. Uh, and I've been here ever since. So what was it like uh, growing up in Louisiana? Well, most, well, let me say I was a Jonathan White, but before I started that, I worked on a farm. I grew up on the farm. I left the farm, went to the city, and I worked in the uh, uh, Army Bear for about, for about 15 years. And after I left California, after I left uh, uh, Super Bowl, I came here in 1944. So that was uh, Shreveport, Louisiana? Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, Bowie City. Bowie City and Shreveport, but practically the same place. So, um, during that 15 years, uh, was that during the time you met uh, grandmother? Um, well, let's see, in 15 years, I work I in the Army base, uh, I, I, I guess about 10 years, then I, as I got married, I came out here. I had, I had three kids for come out here, by married in Louisiana. So, um, how did you uh, meet grandmother, and how did you know she was the one? Oh, I, one day uh, I see her come around playing, you know. I, I was, I was a man. 
So she was the one, huh? So she was no good. No good. But she, I said, I'll be able to get one small. So I got it small. Yeah. Now, are you talking about a ring, a small ring or something, or what? Uh, that's when I first got married. Okay. And so I'm, I'm, I married her. I, I wasn't a fellow that liked to run around a whole lot. Well, I do a lot to do that. I said a business way. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get those morals from your parents? I, I guess I did. I don't know <laughs> where they how they come by, <laughs> but after all, I didn't like a whole lot of fools. <laughs> yeah. So, how long were your parents married? Oh, quite a while. Maybe four, five years. I don't know. Now, now your grand, uh, your parents, grandfather, um, what were their names? Wooden Tail. My name is Manelia Tail. Before she was a tail, she was a dammer. So that's why I'm locked up with the dammers. And so... Minerva was what, like a, about 101 before she passed away? Yeah. Some, something like that. Uh, what did you do for a living when you moved to uh, California? Well, when I first moved to California, I worked in a factory, a box factory. And an iron farm. I worked in Bob Fact and I worked in the iron farm. That's that's when I doing uh, big my time with Bob Fact and the iron farm because uh, I, I was working the iron farm. I, mean, well, I pulled iron like I was pulling water. <laughs> um, yeah. Made all the pipes for the church. Get sound pipe. So, um, I guess before you moved from Louisiana, you had three children. Yeah, I think of us. I had three. Now, who were they? That were two men. And then everyone else was born here? Yeah. Rest of them were born here. My cultural identity, like that of many Black families who participated in what is known as the Great Migration, is shaped by the migration of my family from the South, specifically, as my grandfather said, Louisiana, and then on my father's side, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, to California. My maternal grandfather, Rafe Taylor Sr., told me that he moved because of the racism, along with the expectation of better economic opportunities. But my grandfather discovered that there really wasn't much of a difference between Louisiana and California, except for the weather. So he just stayed in the Bay Area and created a life of, fu of future opportunities for generations to come. It is a familiar American story. He first worked at the foundry during the Korean War for a couple of years, and then he was able to secure a job in the city of Oakland working in the sewage system, which he did for about 50 years before retiring 
mastering the complex mathematical calculations required to do this job efficiently, but he was never given a supervisor position because he did not have the required piece of paper that said he had achieved a certain level of education. He just had the education and the knowledge. He and my grandmother were also charter members of Antioch Baptist Church. And on my paternal side, my grandparents, Earl and Ella Majet, were charter members of Faith Presbyterian Church. Religion was the basis for community building and collective support. The first garden my grandfather, Rafe Taylor Sr. planted in California was in the front yard of their home on Filbert Street in West Oakland. He planted collard and mustard greens, beans, tomatoes and green onions in the front yard, but people would come by and steal his produce. But the house I remember most, which is pictured here, hopefully you can see that, held a beautiful and bountiful terraced farm style garden in the backyard. Fruit trees such as fig, apple and lemon, collard and mustard greens, tomatoes, artichokes at the bottom scientifically layered for a natural composting process and vegetables and fruit trees placed according to the movement of the sun and the wind. To me, my grandfather was a genius. Occasionally, I would sit with him right under a fig tree and eat the figs right off the tree. But my favorite food thing he would do, and I like to think it was special just for me, is he would fry some potatoes and catfish in a big black kettle on his back porch steps. That was pure love. He went fishing a lot with my father and uncle, so we ate fresh fried crappie and catfish from the Delta, otherwise known as the Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta, or sometimes they simply said they went fishing at Windy City, a location also along the Delta but closer to the California aqueduct with fast running water and high winds that served to produce great fish. He also had rabbits for a while in a shed in his backyard to eat nice pets. I don't think I ate any rabbit meat, I proclaimed to my grandfather. Yes, you did. He told me I fed you everything. You must be thinking of my mother B. I said, no, he insisted. I fed it all to you. The front walkway leading up to his house was lined with rose bushes, some named after the important women in his life. Minerva, his mother, Elnora, his wife, my grandmother, who was also pictured here, and Lucy, his mother-in-law. And as you turned and went up a couple of steps to the front door, there was a huge bush of honeysuckle, star of jasmine, and birds of paradise. I was always compelled to pluck a couple of those honeysuckle flowers before going into the house. Big Daddy, as my grandfather was called, was always willing to cut a bunch of roses for anyone to take home, year after year. The manner in which we are socialized through a food identity is tied to our political, economic, and cultural socialization. And if you are paying attention, you can learn a lot about someone based on their food staples, preferences, and values. Oops. Where they are from, is there a regional marking, where have they traveled or migrated to and from? Who have they interacted with in a deep and integrated sharing way in a cross-cultural sense? And if you ask the right questions, you will realize that there is a lot of connections between us, especially if there has been some type of migration of your family or you have interacted with migratory families. What are these staples that people maintain? Pasta, rice, oats, what seasonings are maintained. Familiar foods in my life were cooked for me by my mother. The foods of Louisiana, gumbo, jambalaya, red beans and rice, 
rice with everything. My dad always liked rice with everything. Seasonings like paprika, cayenne pepper, garlic, and everything. When I moved to Indiana, someone served me some chili over spaghetti noodles. What is this? I asked. Chili, they said. No, it isn't. Chili is served over rice. When you were sick, my family, my grandfather especially, would feed you chicken feet soup. My grandfather said you had to suck on the chicken toes to get the penicillin so you would feel better. Some years ago, my colleague, Sume from Singapore, had a bad cold. And I jokingly said to her, I can make you some chicken feet soup. Unexpectedly, she said to me, oh my God, I love chicken feet soup. Who knew that my Louisiana, California cold remedy had migrated to Singapore? Growing up in California, my taste in food expanded as I was exposed to food from all over the world, Mexican, Japanese, Vietnamese, Ethiopian, Burmese, Afghani, Italian, French, all types of foods, but mostly Mexican regularly because my best friend there is Mexican. And her family always had authentic food for their celebrations like tamales at Christmas in the same way that our family celebrations included soul food, some featured here. In Indianapolis, there is an area not far from my university, Butler University, that is known as the International Corridor, where you can have Afghani, Indian, Ethiopian, Mexi Mexican, Peruvian, Chinese food, and so much more. And the International Grocery Store in that same area, Saraga, has varieties of fruits that I have never seen before. When I go to any of these places, that was before the pandemic, I would hear multiple languages. But at the Woodruff Place Flea Market, Woodruff Place is a kind of a historic community in Indianapolis, there is a flea market that is held there every first weekend in June every year. And I was introduced to something that I had never seen before, which I have determined to be a signature Indiana food item. Does anyone know what that is? You can unmute and say, if you know. Signature India, no, no one knows? A pork tenderloin sandwich. <laughs> it was good. But that is the only time that I will order one is from that food truck at the Woodruff Place flea market. It's like eating one of those deep fried Oreos at the state fair. The atmosphere and the company actually matter. As a child, I did not think much about food in terms of who grew it, harvested it, prepared it for transport, transported it there, what the cost was. But I think about that a lot today, as many of you do. We have no choice. There have been so many shifts in the agricultural arena just in the last decade, and I would say probably in the last few months especially, struggles and also opportunities that draw us together in multiple ways from both the consumer standpoint and the producer standpoint. And yet, at the center of it all is the political and economic systems that create disparities between us of which we are all responsible for addressing. Some years ago, when there was two grocery store chains, Marsh and Double Eight, they shut down. There were many neighborhoods in the county including the one that I live in, that were suddenly thrust into a food desert. But to replace these stores, different types of efforts that draw the producer of food and the consumer closer together came to the forefront. And this required a blurring of the urban, rural, suburban, and community lines. I was able to drive to, there's a lot of farmer's markets that sprung up. I was able to drive to those farmer's markets but what if I couldn't? 
there are other possibilities, but they are even more expensive. And yet recognizing that many organizations like, for example, the Green Bean Delivery, they adjusted their policies so that they could be more accessible. And in fact, you can purchase groceries, ready-made, healthy meals, or any other similarly configured food items, they can be brought right to you. But there is a price for that. There is always a price for convenience. And now we have the pandemic, which has forced us to make all types of different uh, adjustments and changes just in order to survive. At the heart of our food on a national and international level is the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA. And I'm gonna say a little bit of history about the USDA and actually some also additional information. But here are the facts about the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, it is actually made up of 29 agencies. Until the Department of Homeland Security was established, it was about the largest federal agency or one of them. And it was established in 1862 by Abraham Lincoln, less than a year before he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The only extensive speech that Lincoln gave regarding agriculture occurred in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on September 30th of 1859. In this speech, Lincoln acknowledged that he was not the most expert when it came to the agriculture arena, but he did have his own personal connection to farming. Though at that moment when he was giving that speech, he was speaking as a politician. Towards the beginning of his address, which was at the agricultural fair, President uh, Abraham Lincoln stated the following before offering detailed suggestions on agricultural development. This is what he said. One feature I believe of every fair is a regular address. The agricultural society of the young, prosperous and soon to be great state of Wisconsin has done me the high honor of selecting me to make that address upon this occasion, an honor for which I make my profound and grateful acknowledgement. I presume I am not expected to employ the time ass assigned me in the mere flattery of the farmers as a class. My opinion of them is that in proportion to numbers, they are neither better nor worse than other people. In the nature of things, they are more numerous than any other class. And I believe there really are more attempts at flattering them than any other. The reason of which I cannot perceive, unless it be that they can cast more votes than any other. On reflection, I am not quite sure that there is not cause of suspicion against you in selecting me in some sort of a politician and in no sort farmer to address you. But farmers being the most numerous class, it follows that their interest is the largest interest. It also follows that interest is most worthy of all to be cherished and cultivated. That if there be inevitable conflict between that interest and any other, that other should yield. Again, I suppose it is not expected of me to impart to you much specific information in agriculture. You have no reason to believe and do not believe that I possess it. If that were what you seek in this address, any one any one of your own number or class would be more able to furnish it. You perhaps do expect me to give some general interest to the occasion and to make some general suggestions on practical matters. I shall attempt nothing more. And in such suggestions by me, quite likely very little will be new to you and a large part of the rest possibly already known to be erroneous. He signed the law creating what he called the People's Department on May 15th in 1862, and on May 20th in 1862, President Lincoln signed the Homestead Act, which provided for giving 160 acres of the public domain to any American or prospective citizen who was the head of a family or, or, or over 21 years of age. Title to the land <clears throat> was issued after the settler had resided on it for five years and made improvements on it. The settler could also gain title by residing on the claim for six months, improving the land and paying $1.25 per acre. Later that year, on July 2nd, 1862, 
President Lincoln signed the Morrill Land Grand College Act, which donated public land to the states for colleges of agriculture and the mechanical arts, agreement that was accepted by each of the states at the time to establish one or two institutions that fit that description. Today, there are over 100 of these types of institutions. The second Land Morrill Grant College Act was specifically for historical black colleges and universities, and that was passed in 1890. One university that benefited from this act was Tuskegee University in Alabama, founded by Booker T. Washington. Excuse me, let me take a little. My initial interest in the USDA actually came as a result of lawsuits that I heard and read about concerning Black farmers, Native American farmers, Latino farmers, and women farmers. These lawsuits against the USDA, which have since been settled under the Obama administration, are known as Pickford I and II Black farmers, Keep Siegel, that was Native American uh, indigenous farmers, Garcia, which was Latino Hispanic farmers, and love and involved the discrimination that was women farmers and involved the discrimination that all of these specific groups had received at the county level by USDA agencies and officials who would outright refuse to provide these farmers resources and support for subsidies or loans that was otherwise available to white male farmers. And you'll see these cases covered the 80s to the 90s, kind of early 80s to mid 90s. Furthermore, when various farmers from these groups looked for a way to have their grievances addressed, there was no recourse at the federal level because the Civil Rights Division for the USDA had been eliminated under the Reagan administration. I must let you know, though, that in addition to the activism of people from these groups, who the diligence and work of the late Senator Richard Luger these civil rights divisions were re actually reestablished. I won't go into a lot of detail right now about these cases, but I became particularly interested in what was going to change as a result of these settlements with regard to outreach on the part of the USDA. This is a, that. That was an organizational chart of the USDA, which you can basically see when you go to the website. Additionally, I began hearing about various things like the slow food movement, organic farming, farming cooperatives and collectives, no-till and vertical farming, urban gardening, farmers markets, a movement towards veganism steeped in social justice, which I increasingly realized were ideas that came from a lot of these marginalized farming groups as ways to navigate through an agricultural arena that have become dominated by large agribusiness corporations such as ConAgra and Cargill. Additionally, additionally, as healthcare costs became increasingly astronomical, more and more people started looking to preventative care in areas such as nutrition and exercise, which incorporated issues of food access and more importantly, justice. All of this came through what we are sort of currently experiencing. Now let's look at some more statistics from the USDA. These are from the 2017 Census of Agriculture, which take, actually takes place every five years, though there is often a delay when the numbers are released. These numbers were released uh, last year in April. So just pointing out, just showing you a few statistics um, in terms of the agricultural arena today, and some are actually not, uh, some farmers are kind of hard to account for but there are 2.4 million farmers and ranchers, which is down 3.2%. Um, some other, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but you can actually see them. The average farm income is $43,000, uh, 43,053. A total of 43.6% of farms had positive net cash farm income. 96% of farms and ranches are actually family owned, which um, is kind of a surprising statistic for a lot of people. The average age of all producers is 57.5, which is 
which is up 1.2 years from 2012. There's actually a movement to increase more younger farmers. There are 321,261 young producers aged 35 or less on 240,141 farms. 36% of all uh, producers are female and 56% of all farms have at least one uh, female that is making decisions. Female producers are most heavily engaged in the day-to-day -day decisions along with record keeping and financial management. And most young farmers are actually not necessarily full-time farmers, they're actually part-time farmers so that they can bring in an additional income in order to maintain uh, their farm. Now let's talk about some definitions because I did mention issues of food justice. And then I'll briefly mention an organization that I have paid uh, very close attention to because it's the only women's agricultural organization in the network uh, that is actually centered on social justice. Food apartheid is a relentless social construct that devalues, I have to move this, human beings and assumes that people are unworthy of having access to nutrition food. Food apartheid affects people of all races, including poor white people, although black people and indigenous people in particular are affected disproportionately. Then there are some other definitions that people hear often, uh, food insecurity, a household level, economic and social condition of limited or uncertain access to adequate food. So food sovereignty is a population's right to determine how it is fed. Food justice, is the belief that food is a basic right of all people, a human right, and food desert, which I mentioned previously. The USDA actually has a definition of food desert that defines where there's a low access community, where there are at least 500 people, and or 33% of the census tracts population must reside more than one mile from a supermarket or large grocery stores, and for rural areas, it's actually 10 miles. So some of you that live in an urban community and you live more than a mile from a supermarket basically are actually in a food desert. And if you're in a rural community and you live more than 10 miles from what they would determine to be a grocery store or supermarket, you are actually classified also as to being in a food desert. They might sort of start adjusting that because food access is becoming a little bit different. This is an organization that I have paid quite a bit of attention to. And I'm just gonna show you briefly so you can go to the website. It's the Food Women, Food and Agriculture Network. They do quite a few um, very interesting things. They train women to enter the political arena, to advocate for women farmers. They also do a lot of training of women farmers um, and they do a lot of outreach for uh, young farmers, young women farmers, um, and a lot of different programs, conferences, and this gives you just going through the website. Dr. Jett, Dan Mason. Yes. yes. Just, a, just a quick question. So you, you kind of put miles to relative to your proximity to a grocery store. <clears throat> I lived in Louisville, Kentucky for 10 years. What would Eastern Kentucky be when you have an entire region of a state where PepsiCo had to sponsor buses and dentists to go in because they weren't drinking water, they were only drinking Mountain Dew? Uh, they, they, it was an entire region that had no access to proper food or nutrition or what have you and affected children and, and uh, all races. Uh, I mean, that's not even... 10 miles from a grocery store, it's two hours from a grocery store. Yeah, I mean, they would classify the same way, but you know, it would be kind of an extreme example. And there would be a lot of different ways that the USDA, if they were involved, and it would probably have to come from the community or some sort of grassroots organization would have to figure out how to, how to address it. And there's multiple kind of issues, not just with regard to food that are happening uh, that have caused that um, situation to occur. So, you know, that's, 
that's a big problem. And, and that's one that somebody would look at and say, oh, yes, that's a food desert. Um, and what I'm indicating is that there's a lot of places throughout the country that are food desert and, and worse. And the issue of food sovereignty um, is also important because it's about people actually determining what is the best choice of food for them, not having to have food kind of brought into them um, in a way that is maybe, you know, not culturally sound or is food that they don't really know how to prepare, um, that it's unrecognizable. It's about thinking of ways where people can have control of their own uh, food and, you know, also water, soil quality, all of that. So, um, yes, it's that example you gave is um, one that's, you know, happening everywhere, unfortunately. So there are some connections um, that we can make, and this is where people are really trying to sort of bridge um, the divide that exists in communities like you described, um, but also in the urban context where there's not as much access. Um, there hadn't been traditionally, but now there's a lot of different farmers markets, um, urban gardens, people kind of taking hold of creating their own type of um, healthy food, a lot of restaurants in order to also kind of bridge the gap have developed these kind of farm to table um, ideals and values. I, there are some restaurants that I've seen that actually have their own sort of urban kind of garden farm uh, next to it. There are some farmers in order to um, survive themselves, smaller farmers who have taken to social media as a means to market. Um, what they produce. I've listened to a number of the Young Farmers podcasts, and they um, often talk about how they might grow just a couple of different types of produce, and the way that they get access to different markets is through like uh, social media, Instagram, Twitter, um, and that is one indicator in the um, ag census that um, the USDA looks at, and that is the issue of technology which is um, growing uh, because it's necessary for farmers to really extend their reach, especially young farmers and family farmers. There's another uh, term that I have here that um, I discovered actually through uh, attending a conference with the Women's Farm and Ag Network, um, and it's called agritourism. And I went to a conference in Des Moines, Iowa, and there was a, a farm there that uh, next door they had actually purchased some land to build a um, and they were actually converting a home there to serve as a bed and breakfast and what that was uh, going to be used for was people to come to spend some time there but to also work on their farm um, to have access to it um, just for like a week or so as a form of tourism also at that same location um, and it's just kind of speaking to the innovation of a lot of young farmers. They also had a store located also on their land where they allowed people from the community who had different types of things that they were creating. So it wasn't just like growing produce, but there were people that were um, like creating soaps and uh, different types of things, tortillas, salsa, all kinds of things. The neighborhood would actually uh, come and sort of place their um, items there and it was almost like a collective and they were selling things um, to the community. So it was a real kind of a vibrant, um, vibrant space. So we're connected kind of as consumers, but also as producers um, and small farmers really have to rely upon uh, us like farmers markets. They have to think of creative ways to move what they're growing um, into the community. Now I want to sort of return to a discussion of food and identity, but before I do that, I want to play just another, um, here's just some pictures of different places I have been, different farmer's markets and dog patches, just that's kind of the store that I was just talking about, various farmer's markets. Um, also here pictured here is a barn, a big barn that you see that is from the um, Lutheran church in Iowa that created a um, sort of a collective for refugees to actually learn how to grow and sell 
um, what they wanted to in the farmers markets there as a means of entrepreneurship. Okay, let me see if I can, whoops. Ah. I'm trying to get back to this. Actually, what I'll do is I'm going to, hold on just a moment. Okay. Sorry, I had to go out and then go back in to get to this. Okay, there we go. My daddy, a couple of them bought me in Oklahoma. The rest of them bought me in Louisiana. Were any of our family members, like, um, like great greats, were any of them ever slaves or anything like that? Not as I know of. My grandfather, my, I never did know mama, my, my daddy's mother. All I know is daddy, my Louis mother. All I know of mama's daddy, I didn't know her, her, her mother. So what type of chores did you have to do when you were a kid coming up? Do you remember any of those things? Yeah, little everything. <laughs> see, we had our own farm. I worked on the farm, you see. Milk the cows, feed the hogs, feed the chicken. You ever get chased by any hogs? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, well, in the country where we live, we had plenty of wild hogs. And a lot of times, you know, you had to, if you want to get ready to go to my dad's house, I was scared because I might run up on some old wild hogs. And those hogs are still get after you. Oh, wow. See, I live out in the country. I live in the country. Do you remember what some of the country looked like? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, live. <laughs> I remember how I looked. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, last time I went down in that part of the country, this, the, the woods were so thick, you, you had to be out and crawl through. Wow. Yes, that thick had to got down there. So and I live right on the lake and we could have a trail where we go down and go to the water and fish. I'm just trying to imagine you fishing and crawling through the swamp and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We didn't, we didn't have no trouble getting fish. So a lot of the white would go down there and sand, they would catch fish, and a lot of fish they catch for the market, you know. And we go down there, they give us all the fish we want. Sometimes we fish and catch some, and they give us all the fish we want. So, um, that was pretty nice, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then back in that time, boy, my, my dad, the base castle guard, and give them away. Now what was that? Garfish. It looked like something like an alligator. <laughs> they get big. They get sometimes 10, 12 feet long. No big cat, uh, God. White folks sometimes go down there and gig them, you know. They, they give them to us. We didn't have to buy them. 
Jim to. That must have been so amazing growing up on a farm, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what about hunting? Did you ever do any hunting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we used to hunt. And, and possum, squirrel, rabbit. <laughs> well, I remember the possum because I remember you trapped some in your backyard here in California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we got a possum, squirrel, rabbit. We wouldn't have any, I never did catch a coon. But I had, I had squirrel, I had rabbit, I had possum. I raised a possum since I've been here. I raised one a year, kept one a year. Turn from the table. <laughs> and he was good too. Now, what did your kids say about that feeding the possum from the table? Oh, they didn't say nothing. Of it. Did you give some of them some of the possum? Oh, yeah. When we had, and my brother was living there in Henry. He said, when you get ready to your pee on the and give me a piece of <laughs> they good. That, they got good, good, good white meat. It's good. Does it taste like chicken? No, it doesn't taste like chicken, but it tastes good. <laughs> they, they're real good. No, in, in the country there, we got squirrel, no squirrel, no, they, 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 that's good meat too. So if there was another place you could have grown up besides California, where would you have picked? Would it, would it have been the country or, or did you like California better? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. According to how California was, at one time, California wasn't so hot. And then somebody, the, the country was good, but the, that environment around the country wasn't too good. When you say environment, you meant the people? Yeah. Yeah, I was in the south, you know, white and associated with the color. How was that growing up? How was that? Was that difficult for you to deal with? Well, you know, you just, you just speaking, that's all. Missing, missing, say that, and that's all. You know, see, I live in the deep south, where he widened. He's the same as a dog in the, uh, in this side. See, you never been to a place like that. See, that's where I raised up in a place. He just the same, wasn't good as a dog. I can't imagine being treated that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that rough. So there's a lot of opportunity now that people don't realize, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In the South, oh, everywhere. Not in the... Just like daylight but in dark. Not daylight there. And then it's big dog. Please, he said, well, it was a time when they said black man didn't need no school. All he needed a job. What? See, but that was, see, years ago, they had 
how is cotton in all the pieces it left? A lot of cotton in this, this country. Did you ever? Okay, I'm going to now. I have a little exercise. And if we were together, we would be break, broken down into small groups. But now I'm going to just ask a few questions um, and then I'll stop sharing so we can have a conversation about it. But I wanna know what the signature dishes were from your family um, and also any adjustments that you've made in terms of your familiar foods, if you've moved around or been introduced to different types of food. Um, and also, do you grow your own food? Where do you buy your food from? What your, is your experience with uh, buying food? So we're going to have a, a nice conversation just about culture and food. So let me see if I can. OK. All right, who wants to tell me what your staple items are in your family in terms of your food? Let's see what kind of connections we can have. Who here puts chili over spaghetti noodles? <laughs> yes, Lisa. <laughs> I think you raised your hand. Me? Oh, uh, fr fried apple pies. Oh, fried apple pies. OK. Um, and what is that kind of native to? Like, what? where does that? Southern Kentucky, Southern Kentucky is where my family's from. Okay. Is fried apple pies familiar to anybody else? No. Okay, well that is like a signature item uh, from, from your part of the country. <laughs> How is that different from regular apple pie? Is that like a... It's a hand pie. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. It could possibly be called something else. Uh, we've had a couple of people ch share in the chat. I guess they didn't want to. Oh, here we go. I, was, I, I can read it for you if, if you want. Um, so Lillian shared uh, that her mother's family was from Southeast Missouri and in a rural area. Uh, her grandmother cooked a lot of things in bacon grease and lard. Uh, she also cooked fried chicken on Sundays. Oh, yeah. That's great. So we, um, I'm from, I'm from Alabama and my mother is um, from the South as well. And she always, she always cooks in bacon grease. That's all she uses. Mm. Those, and in the cans, like you maintain the grease? Or... Yeah. So she, anytime she cooks bacon, she, she has it, she has a jar she keeps in the fridge that she puts all her, all her bacon fat in. And did you, now did you carry that tradition on Claire? Uh, I didn't. <laughs> I, I have not. Um, I try to be a little bit healthier. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> when I go home, it's always a treat because then I get to I get to eat, you know, real so good. Doc <clears throat> Dr. Jett? Yes. Sitting behind me is my great grandmother's grease jar. Oh. That, that <laughs> on her gas stove, and this is what the I. So when she passed, I had to have it. Wow. So it, it is sitting right here with me. And actually not a dinner she would make, but the, the treats when we, so she was born in the 1880s, very poor. And the treat was to on Friday nights, watch Dallas with her and eat uh, circus peanuts. You know, the, the orange foamy things. Oh, and you, okay. couple, <laughs> and you couple that with pickled pig feet. So those were when you stayed when you stayed all night with Granny. We would go through jars of pickled pig, pickled pig's feet. That was that was the treat. Wow. Well, when, when you were talking about peanuts, I was thinking of my my dad, who is here. There he is, Dad. Um, he would always say, "Go get some goobers," and we would take the the goobers too. <laughs> The baseball game <laughs> to go see the Oakland A's and it would be goober shells all over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've had a couple more people share in the chat. Uh, so Christine, uh, her family always had beans with ham hocks, uh, potatoes, and cornbread. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sabrina shared uh, chicken and dumplings with drop biscuit <laughs> dumplings um, and also biscuits and sausage gravy cooked in bacon grease. So I think bacon grease is a pretty pretty common theme here. 
Yes, I exactly. Just made, uh, it's Leslie, and I just made uh, biscuits and gravy this past weekend with uh, with bacon grease, and that's <laughs> that's from my uh, grandmother that that lived in Kentucky. So, very common theme. <laughs> oh, here here's one uh, from Michelle. Uh, she also said fried chicken on Sundays, but sweet tea. Oh so yeah, sweet tea is a very regional mm -hmm. regional drink. So. Uh, and I, I gotta say, the sweet tea they serve here is not sweet tea. <laughs> it's not, yeah. not correct. And do not try to sweeten cold tea. <laughs> no, you it does not work. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ooh, cast iron cooking. Uh, I believe. Oh, yes. uh, Sabrina said that as well. That's. I feel like that's definitely a a kind of a, tr a family tradition. You know, there's always that one cast iron that gets passed down through the generations. Yeah, absolutely. And there's all different types of cast irons now um, for the skillets. But yes, definitely. Oh, Linda, yeah. you raised your hand. You, got, you guys, I grew up in New England. None of this grease and all this stuff. It was always seafood and um, um, it very different from what you guys eat. Okay. Do, you cook, do you cook seafood now, Linda? Not very often um, because it's it's, I have to get it fresh. You know, if I want to go to the market and get it, that's fine. But, um, you know, I cooked for 50 years. I don't cook a whole lot anymore. <laughs> so, well, now, it's, Linda, it's, it's really, all, it's yeah. the preparation. How did you, how did you cook the seafood? That's well, all. we always grilled it back then. Oh, yeah, no. We <laughs> always grilled it. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, there was, there was one, thing that my mother used to make for us for lunch. I had three brothers. And so kids lunch was a lot different than grown ups lunch. Mm -hmm. And she would take saltine crackers and put a bunch of them on a plate. And then she would have tomato soup, put an egg in it, not very much milk. So it's kind of a, a thick, thick sauce and pour that over the saltine crackers. And oh, that was wow. lunch. It wasn't bad. Hmm. She could never feed it to my father because he always wanted meat and potatoes. But you know, <laughs> for kids, for kids' lunch, it was it was like soup and crackers. But it oh, and then uh, if she had cheese, she would grate the cheese and put the cheese in there too. So, wow, it was yeah, good. very different. Yeah, it was good. I will say something completely different. My um, my father's uh, or my husband's family is uh, they're from uh, Britain, and uh, when he was growing up, everything was on toast. It was beans on toast, sardines on toast. They would do a Sunday roast and keep the uh, beef drippings and and put that on bread and. Uh, just, you know, he doesn't continue eating that today, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just a to totally different um, food upbringing, even though they lived here in the States, uh, what they ate as kids growing up. Yeah, and it's, it's so interesting how we have like a particular, um, you know, the larger meal kind of on Sunday, um, and then also what we have determined to be healthy versus unhealthy. Um, and yet, you know, a lot of people in my family, you know, cooked, and I think it's because they grew a, a lot of their own food, and there was always a lot of vegetables and fruits, but uh, my grandparents lived well into their 90s, um, and my great-grandmother lived to be, I think, about 104 or something like that, um, and so longevity really kind of runs in the family, but I think a lot of it has to do with um, sort of growing your own food um, and, and also having that sort of access uh, to food. But we have changed, like we take these, these um, food items from our family and then we change them kind of like what Claire said, like, oh no, I don't use that lard. You know, I don't use that bacon grease. I use like olive oil or canola or something um, to suggest, you know, that it is, you know, healthier. Um, and, you know, possibly it could be, but there's so many things that go into actually being a healthy person, not just the food. And some of the food that we eat is actually is healthy, even though it may appear not to be, um, because it is related to something that is endearing 
to you um, and part of your family and tradition and part of your culture. Um, and so it provides you comfort where other things, other types of food that may be more healthy doesn't necessarily. So others, how, so can I fry chicken on Sundays with biscuits, rice, and yam sweet tea? Oh, yeah. That sounds just like. Uh, uh, quite a few people have talked about uh, canning, about canning their vegetables and fruits. Yeah, absolutely. That is definitely a tradition um, that a lot of people um, do. And it's because it just kind of keeps um, your food for you through, I mean, like through the winter months. Um, and especially if you've grown a lot of your own. Let's see, what else? Dr. Jen, I'd like to offer it up my, uh, my family traditions. I'm from Trinidad. I'm way, way not from here. Oh. So the uh, pork tenderloin was a shock to me too. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I come from Trinidad, which is a very multicultural society. So we have African um, Africans who were brought as slaves. We have Indians from continental India that was, they, they were brought as indentured laborers. Chinese, Portuguese, Syrian, Lebanese. So we have a complete mix of food traditions. And so we can, in my house, we can have like curry on one day and then pilau, which is a sort of African version of a rice pilau. Mm. Um, you know, and then yeah, corned beef and cabbage, which apparently is very Portuguese and um, bacalao, saltfish, salted cod. And so all those things are things I try to continue um, with me. I, I brought them all here. I show them to anyone who wants to learn or taste. I'm happy to show anybody. Um, and I do go yeah, count me in. I, well, just like today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but and yeah. Some of it is, is familiar. Yeah. But for instance, pastels. So pastels, uh, a uh, dish that we make for Christmas. It's always associated with Christmas. We rarely eat it out of season, but it's basically a tamale. Uh -huh. If you go to Venezuela, they call it something else. And if you go to um, Dominican Republic, they call it something else. But essentially, it's a tamale. It's a masa with some sort of filling inside of a husk, or in our case, we use a banana leaf. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, so a friend of mine from Nicaragua makes tamales with banana leaves. Mm -hmm. So it's the same dish with a different name from a different place, but yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. That's a, no a nice way to actually sort of bring people together, too, is to kind of share some, some different, um, you know, cooking um, sort of staples and signature dishes from your family. Um, I think that's always kind of fun. Uh, a fun thing to do and it's a really interesting way to get to know people and also kind of like what Marisol says to to know where the food comes from and why it is prepared in a certain way and how it's been passed down um, through the family as something being very significant and then also what you pointed out Marisol is this idea of that we cook certain things to um, represent like a celebration like during the holidays um, and I remember my, my grandfather always made hoghead cheese um, during the holiday season. Um, and there would be like a spicy, it would come out in a, like a log sort of in a, in a plain one. Um, and that's the only time that I remember sort of seeing it. And here's another thing too, with family gatherings, there's always people that are associated with particular dishes. You know, so like one aunt would always bring the same dish every time the family got, like you are the macaroni and cheese person, and you are the salad person, and you, uh, you know, bring this particular thing. I thought I heard somebody was gonna say something. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, my uncle um, was a farmer in rural Missouri, and I heard uh, your grandfather, uh, great grandfather, I guess, mentioned squirrel. My uncle also killed squirrels and I, I think from time to time he, they prepared them. And also I remember at Thanksgiving we would go there and he always had a turkey he shot and uh, killed. Uh, you know, so uh, that is uh, part of the, you know, Missouri was kind of southern, mm -hmm. especially southeast Missouri. And so 
that the food crossed over racial lines. It was not just, you know, in one group. It was very Southern. Um, another thing I think is interesting, um, and it, that is how culture changes, because when I was a teenager and later as a college student, I had pizza, Mexican food, and um, Chinese food in Mexican and Chinese restaurants. My mother had never had any of this. Uh, she was unfamiliar with pizza. She had bought tamales from the tamale man in Evansville in the 1950s, but never had any of the other Mexican food that you would find common today. And she had um, uh, had the canned chef, you know, canned um, a Chinese uh, stuff. Uh, 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 it was Latoy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was trying to think of, a, of the name of it. My head, my head was like, wait a minute, I know exactly what she's talking about. <laughs> we, we had it, we had it too. Go to a Chinese restaurant and have the other items. She was totally unfamiliar with that. And so those were all things that as a kid, I entered, as a young adult, I introduced to her that she'd never had. And that probably goes on even now, though with all the chains, it's probably less likely that people would be um, totally in their cultural area food-wise. Mm -hmm. We have more chains today, but it's kind of interesting that I got to live through that and see, um, you know, see uh, cultural food and then introduce my mother to things she'd never had. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like something that I didn't eat as a child, but that my own children ate, which is sushi. Oh, uh, that it was kind of introduced um, at some point, and maybe it had been around, um, but I did not have that myself as a child. But my daughter like loves, loves sushi. So it's it's about all these different kind of exchanges that happen, but also that brings people together. It's a a, a place of familiarity, um, and also kind of exposes people to different kind of cultures. And then you also see kind of some similarities there um, in between, kind of like what you said, that some things that we identify with particular groups actually exist in various groups or in different forms and also have different markings in terms of like regional markings through the country or from different locations in the world that people have come and brought uh, various food. Does anyone have any questions um, about anything that I have? talked about I think we're I think there, there were a few that came through um, in the chat that I just kind of wanted to to bring some attention to and I believe uh, Marisol asked this one uh, about efforts to preserve and teach the food ways um, to accompany that pr produce uh, she said I think sometimes vegetables go uncultivated and unused because the consumers don't know what to do with them or have never been taught convenient food continues to threaten food traditions so do you see do you see an effort in those kinds of those kinds of uh, teachings, I guess? I do. Actually, there is a kind of a youth advocate organization called Kepra um, Institute and also I think Flatter House Farms and, and it could be some in you in the community in New Harmony where there will be um, these organizations that will sell produce with Kepra. They have a CSA. So I actually get a bag of groceries from them. Uh, once a month. And previously, before the pandemic hit, they would have um, a food cooking demonstration. Um, and also with the bag of uh, produce that I get from them, which actually comes from a, a Black Farm Collective group, there are recipes that are also in the bag um, explaining how to cook the various kind of, you know, items that could be unfamiliar um, to people. And in fact, like one time I got some um, Purple, I think they're purple potatoes. And I didn't know what that what that was. <laughs> so they're like, it's potatoes, but they're purple, but I had never seen that before. Um, so I was glad that they had some information uh, provided for that. And also um, the international grocery store that I went to, um, that I've gone to, Saraga, I haven't gone lately. Um, but I teach this agriculture and food justice class, and I'll always um, I'll go pick up some fruit from Saraga, um, which has actually come from various parts of the world. 
and take it to my class and I don't label it, I ask my students to tell me what the fruit is and where it came from um, and they can hardly identify it. Um, they have no idea, you know, things like dragon fruit. I mean, it, all different types of stuff that has come um, from like Mexico or some other places um, that is available right here um, in Indianapolis. So yes, there are efforts to actually teach people um, how to, to cook or prepare or eat raw um, the food that they are distributing. And you, you hit on something because here in New Harmony, I work uh, once a month at a food pantry and we, we serve anywhere between 75 and 110 families and a family can equal one person or, or more. Yeah. And always the last to go are the dried beans, which arguably are the most nutritious. Uh, and, you know, it's, I don't think people have maybe the, the knowledge on how to prepare them or maybe the means to prepare them. And so, you, you know, you could argue that there's, there's definitely a case for community kitchens. And I think that's you know, definitely something, you know, further pushing in, in these communities, especially at these, these hard times to help people just kind of understand what nutrition actually is. And, you know, not the, not the process uh, stuff you get out of a box. And so. Yeah, it could be a time factor too. Um, in terms of the preparation of dry bean, like you know, soak them, and you know there could be some other reasons um, that that is not something that they're really um, you know uh, picking up. But I think you're right, just providing the information to people, um, and and I like the 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 uh, cooking demonstrations. Um, well, we haven't done them lately, but once we get past <laughs> this pandemic. <laughs> Um, that would be, and then also, you know, if you have technology available um, or through the library or something, just kind of looking things up to see how they're, they're prepared. I've been doing that to, you know, like to fix things. You kind of look up and see um, how to do that. Uh, so we are, we're a little bit over our time. So uh, maybe just one or two more questions um, and then we'll kind of wrap up. But I had a question regarding food deserts. So uh, New Harmony does not have a grocery store, but we have a Dollar General. How are Dollar Generals kind of like, are, are, how are they fitting in into the definition of a supermarket, I guess? Are they, are they a supermarket? I mean, they don't have fresh produce, but they do have, you know, other food, so. Yeah, the, yeah, the USDA would probably still say you're in a food desert because um, it's access to really healthy food that they're sort of looking for. So, but I, I, mean, that's up, kind of what I was thinking. But I looked up, uh, I actually did like a little search to see what type of farmers markets mm -hmm. um, that you all have in that area or, and actually farms that are actually selling. And I came across about three or four. Um, and so that would be one way to address um, you know, what is not necessarily being provided by, by no. Dollar General or, yeah. you know, a lot of places are relying on the gas stations that also have some things there and it's yeah. all cool. yeah. So we do have a, a farmer's market, uh, a quite fantastic farmer's market actually that takes place uh, May through September, I believe. I believe uh, they, ju they just wrapped up their season. Um, so we, there's a lot of fresh produce through there. Uh, recently, and Dan might know the exact time or someone else from New Harmony, um, one of our gas stations actually started getting fresh produce weekly. Yeah. Um, so when Dollar General came in, they obviously didn't have fresh produce. So I guess our, uh, one, of the, one of the gas stations saw that need for it and gets deliveries. And I, I don't know, Dan or Linda, do you remember how long ago they started getting that? It, it's, been a couple, it's been a couple of months at least. Yeah, it, this summer, yeah. yeah. It's been two or three months and it's been successful and I think they've done uh, a solid job. And uh, I, I think the majority of people in Posey County, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's very strange, Dr. Jett. I mean, we live in an agricultural county and, mm -hmm. you know, access to fresh food is, you know, once a week, if you will. Um, and, or from a gas station that is working to provide that. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that uh, um, definitely we, we, should, we should work to try to, to affect, so. Yeah, it could be some sort of community if there's some land there that is, you know, collectively or publicly owned or, you know, zoned, however, you can collectively start something, um, you know, like a community garden 
Yeah, and, um, and, we, and, and, and we have, and I will actually say that um, the Lynn's House, which is actually owned by, by the Colonial Danes, uh, this year has done an amazing job with their garden and the produce was given to the community and it has, it has uh, gotten people fired up about next season. So, yeah. uh, yes, so. Um, uh, so we got one more question. Okay. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, and this is from Marisol again. Is the number of black owned farms still declining, holding steady or growing? It is slightly growing, actually. Where I have seen, um, and I'm just looking at kind of like the census numbers and also that the way that we are, the USDA in particular is defining farms, um, by, uh, defining farm ownership is um, also a little bit different, which has allowed for um, a slight increase. Where there's been a slight decrease has been in the number of women farmers, which is a little bit um, strange um, considering how active I've seen a number of the women farmers, but yeah, the black farmers, it's, it's growing slightly. And I think that also has to do with the fact that there's a lot of collectives, a um, lot of young black farming collectives that are coming to the forefront. Um, and I've also seen an indigenous uh, group, uh, indigenous chefs that also have been um, kind of coming together and creating kind of a farm, but also a collective just addressing kind of food sovereignty issues uh, within the various nations that they represent. So I think that we will, there's more outreach efforts with USDA um, although the structure of the USDA changed a little bit with the present administration. And so we'll, we'll have to see what happens going forward. All right, um, so I am gonna pull up my screen again. Um, and while I'm doing that, um, uh, Dr. Jett, if you wouldn't mind sharing your email address in the chat, a couple people oh. have asked for it. Oh, definitely. Claire, um, one, whoops. Yes. You, One you, of the things that I think is so important in Posey County, and I'm sure it's in other counties, is partners, partners in food, the farmers that collectively get together and supply food. Yes, that's very important for their own survival, too. Um, and, and because um, if they're not diversifying in terms of their own farm efforts, then um, it becomes difficult to be successful within the current um, market, global agricultural market. So yeah, farming collectives are amazing. Dr. Jed, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, and when you gave us the wonderful taping of your grandfather, I was intrigued by his reference to chicken feet soup and how you have to eat it to get your penicillin. And I was just wondering, is there a real medicinal extra special value in chicken feet? I think so. I always feel better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I did fix it for my colleague, Sue May, and she said it was great and it helped her out a lot. Okay. Um, so yes, I absolutely think, believe in it. And, and that could be part of it, you know, like chicken feet or chicken soup. You know, uh, generally, um, people that have that after they've been sick say, yeah, they feel good. But it's something about that chicken feet um, that, you know, that for me, um, when I cook it, and I try to use my grandfather the way that he cooked it, which was just kind of boiling it, but also putting vegetables and stuff um, in it. Um, and I try to, and following what he said, you know, you have to suck on the feet. <laughs> yeah. is where there's a lot of sort of fatty stuff there. <laughs> um, yes, I would say it definitely is a cure. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Terry, for being with us. Yes, um, thank you for having me. Thank you to Indiana Humanities um, and the Speakers Bureau. Um, that's where, where we got to, got to find uh, Dr. Jett, so we thank them for that. Um, so just wanna uh, kind of share a few things with you guys before we end. Um, our speaker series is continuing. Uh, we're going all the way until about mid-November, so we have uh, a few left. Uh, so uh, Thursday, October 22nd, uh, we have Lisa Below with her presentation, We Never Leave Home. 
She is an English instructor at USI and she's going to be talking about rural life in literature and I think it'll be quite interesting. Um, on Thursday, November 5th, we have Dr. Zach Ward, who is an, uh, a professor in the health professions uh, department at USI. And he's going to be talking about the healthcare crisis of rural America um, and a reason for hope, um, which I think is uh, very interesting as well. So uh, great uh, upcoming presentations. Um, please stay connected with us. Um, we love to have you guys come back and we love to let you guys know what's going on. Um, we have a monthly e-newsletter, uh, which you can find at usi.edu forward slash in harmony. There's also a sign up there so you can get it delivered to your uh, email every month. Um, that'll, our October edition will actually be coming out uh, in the next few days or so. Um, so definitely don't want to miss that. And then of course we have our social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. Uh, so please follow us on there. And then if you are interested in uh, the speaker series and want to see the previous presentations or want to learn more about our up upcoming presentations, uh, please visit usi.edu forward slash crossroads speakers. Uh, so once again, thank you guys so much uh, for coming. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jett, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Everyone. Thank you.